everyone. My name is Christina Andonov. I am a solutions architect at AWS, and I'm helping customers build platforms on top of Kubernetes. And before AWS, I was a platform engineer and SRE and DevOps and all the way back to sysadmin. And as far back as I can remember, we have been automating and writing infrastructure as code. Back in the day, we had tools like Puppet and Chef, then came along Ansible and Terraform. So let's see with all that years of writing automation, where are we today and how are we creating and deploying applications in production? So usually when an organization reaches a certain size, the platform team starts to split up into sub-teams. And we have the networking team and they have their own set of automation and infrastructure as code and they create AWS accounts, lay down the VPCs and the subnets and then they hand it off to the infra team who creates the EKS clusters and put in the add-ons on those clusters. And then comes in observability, they set up the logging, monitoring, tracing, tooling, and all that. And let's not forget the security and compliance team who is supposed to um, set up the security and compliance tooling. And for the most part, these teams collectively produce what we call a production-ready Kubernetes clusters. Your organization might be a little different. There might be a CI, CD team, but it roughly looks like this. And then once they create those production-ready Kubernetes clusters, they hand them off to developers to deploy their applications. And those applications need AWS resources. And that's how we deploy to production today. So there are a few companies in the world today, a handful of them that we've all heard of that can click a button and have this in production today. How many of you here have heard of um, Chaos Monkey? Okay, a good amount, almost everybody. And how many of you use Chaos Monkey in production? Not a single hand raised. Oh, there's one, I wanna talk to you after. <laughs> Come find me. Um, but my point being is, even though the very few have figured this out and they've been very public about it and how they do it, it's hard to reproduce for the rest of us to the point where the majority of the organizations today take months to do this. And they take months for the first account, for the second, for the third, for the hundredth account. This takes months to get from zero to production. Now if you had snow day. So can you tell me how is it that we have been automating as far back as I can remember, and this still takes months. Okay, we're gonna figure that out today. Uh, and in the beginning when I introduced myself, I said I help organizations build platforms on top of Kubernetes. Well, the, the fact is that they already have platforms on Kubernetes and their platform looks like this. So I don't per se help them build them, I actually, what I do is I help them take a step back and look at that platform and ev evaluate where do those months go? Where is the bottleneck in that platform? What takes the longest? There are multiple inefficiencies, but what in, which one takes the longest? And then figure out a way to improve that bottleneck and, and guide them and get it to adoption. So let's take a deeper dive into that platform and see what takes the longest. So we have the platform team, they created the Kubernetes cluster. They also created the Helm chart for the development team to then deploy code. Once you merge code, there's some CI tooling, builds a container, and of course a GitOps uh, CD picks it up and deploys it to Kubernetes. For the most part, this process works well for both parties. Platform team is happy here, development team is happy here. What happens though is that application doesn't just need compute, it does need resources in AWS. It needs a database, it needs an S3 bucket, it even needs an event-driven architecture. So how would we deploy 
those AWS resources? Well, remember that platform team? That platform team creates infrastructure as code. And those resources are considered infrastructure. So we were gonna, like the, the natural notion is let's in, use in the infrastructure as code to create them. So a platform team can use Terraform, but developers don't have direct access to Terraform. So some organizations would prefix the platform team with either a Slack channel or a Jira ticketing. Anybody doing ticket ops today? Yep, a few people. So at a certain point in organizations when they grow, maybe 100, 200 developers, this platform team starts to become the bottleneck to the point where the AWS resources takes days, sometimes weeks to get to the developer. At which point, the organization has the amazing idea, let's open up Terraform to developers. Okay, well, let's try to do that and see how that would work. What would it take a developer to create an S3 bucket? Just one of those resources, not all of them, just one. Well, that bucket actually needs, is more than one resource because the application needs to talk to the bucket. So you have to create the access for the bucket. Okay. So let's see what the Terraform looks like for this to create the three AWS resources that are needed, just like one side of the story. Well, the Terraform looks like this. And you don't have to read it, it's, it's a lot of Terraform for just three resources. And of course you tell me, well, Christina, you told us you were a platform engineer before. You are not gonna give this to developers, come on. You're gonna put it in the module. Okay, okay, let's put it in the module. So we put it in the module and we hand this off to developers with the best documentation we have. And then the developers somehow have to apply it to the AWS account. But they're not gonna, I mean, if the organization is at a certain size, not only they're not gonna apply it, but security is not gonna agree with this. They're not gonna just give AWS keys to your developers and say, go run Terraform on your local machines. Now you have to build a whole system around Terraform to deploy this for a developer. You have to put Terraform in a pipeline. You have to build multiple layers of authentication. One authentication to the pipeline then another to the state file, then another to the AWS account. Not only that, but I bet compliance is gonna ask you to trace that developer identity all the way through those authentications in order to create the bucket. Those systems are not easy to build. And if you've built one, you know that. And you know it's not just like these six boxes we have in the picture here. It's a lot more complex than that. Let's say we build this system, and now a developer can apply Terraform using that system to the account. That only gives us AWS resources. Then they have to come to the AWS resources and have to know to grab the bucket name, which is, well, straightforward. If my application needs to talk to the, an S3 bucket, yes, I need to give it the bucket name. But what's not so straightforward is that row ARN that as a developer I need to grab and I have to know where exactly to put it in my Helm chart and what that value is and then have the Argo CD or Flux pick it up and deploy it to my cluster and hopefully I didn't mistype anything and this works the first time. So let's talk about this. This here, even with the manual process, this is kind of the best case scenario, right? How long do you think a developer going through this would take to create an S3 bucket? My guess is roughly a couple hours maybe to get it working. So if my application has an S3 bucket, that's one resource, but applications rarely have one resource. Usually we see them with, I mean, for easier mind math, let's do 10. So if each application has 10 resources and I have 100 applications, and each one takes two to three hours, that is like thousands of hours of developer time to deploy to a new account, to send up our whole application in a new account. And that's not all because once those resources are deployed, 
Well, guess what? We forgot about the security and compliance team. They did set a compliance tool in our account. And that tool might go and change the bucket. Maybe it can change the life cycle policy if it's not um, according to our compliance to the point that even that Terraform module that I worked so hard on now might not even be the source of truth anymore. Okay, so let's go back here. And I think we evaluated the platform and even though there might be some inefficiencies, I think we identified what takes the longest, like the biggest bottleneck. And the biggest bottleneck is how developers create AWS resources. And I just showed you actually a very efficient way of creating AWS resources. But we can go a little bit further and dive a little bit deeper on that way. Let's just get some, a little bit more screen space to tell you exactly what I mean. So that automation, that Terraform module that was created for developers and that pipeline with all the authentication layers and so on, that was actually created by the infra team for developers. And for the most part, Terraform works, but if you have used it, well, sometimes Terraform apply fails for no apparent reason. So guess what? If this fails, <laughs> and if I'm a developer, and those of you who laugh, I know you use Terraform. <laughs> Um, well, guess what? I have to go and open a JIRA ticket or uh, set up a meeting with the platform team to now get co come and fix my pipeline. And let's not forget that that uh, compliance team we talked about, maybe they made a change on my resource and now my kit doesn't, um, it, it's not, um, I don't have a GitOps workflow, so now I go back to that team and I have to yet set another meeting, another Jira ticket. Oh, and what if that resource goes in the network? What is the, if it goes in the VPC and I need a change? Well, then I have to get the networking team involved. And if something is off there, well, guess what? That's another meeting and another Jira ticket. All right, so now we have thousands of hours of engineering time to deploy to, to an account. And then on top of those thousands of hours, we have to set up meetings and JIRA tickets and communicate via spreadsheets. And that takes even longer. I mean, to set up a meeting, that's just one meeting. It's like, you, it's gonna take a week to set it up, right? So there must be a better way. And the better way to do this is actually to create those resources via APIs. And we do use APIs today on a daily basis for a lot of other things. Let me give you an example. If you were to go online and do an online purchase with your credit card, you are not gonna go and pick up the phone and call your bank and go up, set up a meeting with them to give them your credit card information for them, for then them to set up a meeting with the database team to add that entry into the database. You're gonna call an API and that API will have all the compliance and security built in for you to process a credit card transaction. So why can't we apply the same thing for developers? Build APIs that uh, our compliance team and security team, database architects, everybody can collaborate to build those APIs via code. And one thing I wanna promise you here, if those teams are communicating via code, all the meetings and the spreadsheets and the Jira tickets are gonna go completely away. That's not gonna happen. I just wanted you to enjoy that thought for a moment. <laughs> What I can promise you, they're going to get significantly reduced. So that then a developer, if we have this API, then a developer can come in, request the resource, and they'll get it in a matter of minutes. So when you build API, you have options. You can build them from scratch, but I would argue that you should build them with Kubernetes. 
And let's talk about that, about that uh, a little bit because when I say usually Kubernetes, everybody thinks container orchestrator because Kubernetes came out as a container orchestration tool. And for the longest time, we have used it to orchestrate containers. And slowly and surely, it started managing infrastructure resources via APIs. It, you started creating load balancers and Route 53 records. Um, then came up some projects where you could even create Kubernetes clusters via Kubernetes APIs and EBS volumes. So why don't we do that for all of the AWS? And um, here is the change of mindset I want to do Kubernetes from a container orchestrator to an API framework. Because if you use it as an API framework, it provides all the mechanics. You don't have to build the APIs from scratch. It provides all the mechanics to build an API. And actually, there are open source projects that you don't even need to build the APIs with code. You can build them with zero code, just a lot of YAML. And some of these projects are ACK and Crossplane. So ACK is an open source project that initially came from AWS, AWS open sourced it. Uh, and currently it's very simple to use and it provides um, a subset of resources. We have about 40 something resources that it supports AWS wise. And for most organizations, that will be enough. Uh, also, uh, we provide enterprise support for a little bit over 20, 20 resources that are in GA. Crossplane is an open source project that came from a company called Upbound. They open sourced it, they donated it to CNCF, and it's currently up for graduation. It is in the process. It, under the hood, uh, it uses a little bit of Terraform. So essentially it would cover AWS resource wise, almost everything that Terraform covers, which is essentially everything that you might need. Um, and then for enterprise support, you would need to talk to a bound. Uh, okay, so let's take a look at what would it be to create an S3 bucket using one of those controllers. Well, for first and foremost, the platform team has to set up that controller in your account. Once the controller is set up and configured properly, then they can set some abstractions, add an S3 bucket option to the Helm chart. And here, our goal is to make it as simple for developers as S3 enabled true. Remember, this should be as easy as going and making an online purchase with your credit card. So once that happens, we can use the exact same automation tools to deploy that S3 bucket, deploy a resource called S3 bucket in our cluster, and that will then cr not only create the bucket, but do all the connecting pieces and wire all the permissions to create the bucket. Okay. I said a lot of things, but uh, nothing is as good as a demo and seeing how this works uh, in real world. So let's take a look at what we have set up here. So we have an Argo CD application uh, that would just deploy our very simple app. Our app is here, it has a deployment and it has a claim for an S3 bucket. One thing to notice is I did not set up the sync policy as automatic and we're at GitOps Con, so I am not going to be using GitOps here on purpose for demo purposes. Usually you can enable it, it's gonna work just fine for demo just to make sure we talk through, that's why I'm not uh, doing that. So let's go and take a look at the developer interface. Remember, this is what we want, S3 enable true and we want a secure and compliant S3 bucket. So let's deploy this application to, let's see our Argo CD right now, has no application, so let's go here and um, apply this. Okay, 
this is the live demo, so please wish me luck with the internet. <laughs> okay, uh, let's make this a little bigger. So what is happening here? We deployed our application and it is a deployment in an S3 bucket. So what I expect to happen here was once I click sync is my deployment will should fail because the S3 bucket is not there. But instead of failing, I can now use another layer of tooling. I can use Argo sync, um, sync hooks, sync waves, sorry. <laughs> Uh, so I have given it a, a, a sync wave for the deployment to wait for the S3 bucket. So the S3 bucket will be created first and then it will wait to then create the deployment. But I just wanted to point out, so this S3 bucket here, remember, it either had a ticket or it had that disjoint workflow that I had to create it with and then come and grab the values and put them to give them to the deployment. This here, it's the exact same tooling I'm using. This is, uh, let me just think it real quick. So it starts going and creating the S3 bucket and all the resources under the hood. Okay, so it's, it's creating everything right now. Um, those hearts that you see here, the green hearts and the red hearts uh, with Argo, that usually doesn't work out of the box. I have a special configuration for Argo to recognize those resources. And uh, so it, it gives me the statuses. So it seems like something is off here. Um, let's go and troubleshoot it. It seems like this is like flickering, right? So maybe this would be, uh, how about make this bigger? Let's make it bigger. Okay, let's troubleshoot this. And right here in the Argo UI, I can see, I'm gonna read this because I don't know if you can see it in the back of the room, but it says, attempting to provision a resource without tags. The following tags are required, an owner tag, okay. So as a developer, I can figure out that I need to add an owner tag to my bucket. It's required probably by the security and the compliance team and Look at that, somebody prepared the PR for us to just go ahead and, and merge. Okay. Uh, let me get this bigger here. All right, so let's go back, zoom out a little bit and see. I'm gonna go ahead and, is there a hard refresh? There we go. Let's refresh it so the change gets picked up. But so, I wanted to point something here. So as a developer, I create this bucket and I don't need to know the complexity that goes under the hood to create an S3 bucket. It can be as simple as enable through, but using these tools and connecting uh, ACK or crossplane with Argo or Flux, I can bubble up the status and I can still provide additional self-service to developers. They can troubleshoot what's going on when things don't go right and when they need to do, um, they need to troubleshoot those resources. Oh, come on. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, thank you, thank you. Yes, this, was ha this is what happens when you don't do the GitOps. <laughs> you do have to click a button, so yes, do use GitOps. So let's see. Yeah, let's give it a minute. But um, reiterating on this right now, um, this is how APIs work. We're cre we just created one API, we can abstract the complexity, uh, we can expose an easy interface. We can even give developers the ability to, um, ah, there, okay, <laughs> um, Let's zoom out a little bit. So, um, and you can see the bucket actually, this is blocking public access, adding encryption to the bucket. So this is what is making, um, I can make that bucket secure. 
I'll zoom all the way out and we are going to wait it out. Almost there. Okay, so over here, if I go to my AWS console and I refresh my buckets, I should see my new bucket. There it is. I do have a bucket. And let's go back here. Okay, and now my deployment is coming right up. And once I have my pod, I can go in my pod and I can check the logs and I can make this a little bit bigger. So uh, I have a bash script that uploaded a file to my S3 bucket and then listed the content of that bucket to show that I do have access and I can go to the bucket and refresh and I see the text file. Yay, the demo, it worked. Okay, let's go back here now. All right, so this was really nice and the developer interface worked like magic. Right? It was so simple and so nice. But I saw there's more platform engineers in this room. And if you're a platform engineer like me, well, I just changed the transmission from stick shift to automatic, and I want to know how did that happen. <laughs> so what did we do on the platform side to make that interface easier? Well, what we did is first, we installed crossplane, and when you install crossplane, nothing happens. It installs a bunch of CRDs in your cluster. Then we had to set up the AWS provider that give us the give us the ability and the APIs to create some AWS resources. Then we had to set up a Kubernetes provider because we do need to create some Kubernetes resources. And also we had to to set up compositions to compose those resources and be able to pass values from one resource to the other. And we had to create yet another abstraction API for developers to talk to. So when a developer claims that API, it selects the composition, it creates those managed resources in the cluster, and then they uh, create the um, the AWS resources, the service account, secret, and wire all that up. And I just wanted to um, reiterate here that the power of APIs when it comes to Kubernetes is not just installing ACK or Crossplane, those controllers to create the APIs. It's how they integrate with the rest of the ecosystem. We just saw how the integration with Argo CD worked and we did see how the integration with OPA Gatekeeper worked because that owner tag, that was a gatekeeper policy that prevented that developer to create the bucket. What are customers creating today with ACK and Crossplane? Well, guess what? They create IAM because everything needs permissions and they create S3 buckets is the top resource. That's why I showed you an S3 bucket, RDS instances, Kubernetes clusters, event-driven architectures, SQS, SNS, and so on. And going back to our platform, a um, couple takeaways I want to make sure we point out here. So I showed this to a lot of platform engineers and, the, and somehow, their brain always goes, is like, this is super awesome. I'm gonna start using it tomorrow and I'm gonna start creating everything with APIs tomorrow. And I'm gonna start at the networking layer and I'm gonna be creating VPCs and accounts. And yes, somebody was shaking their head, perfect, don't do that. And why, I just wanted to reiterate again, that's not where our bottleneck is. On the platform side, those teams they are the producer of that Terraform and they're the consumer of that Terraform. And where the APIs are strongest is when those technical teams have to communicate to each other. So if start building APIs from the development side, that's where you wanna focus your efforts with building the APIs. On the platform side, don't forget to 
adopt and update your platform with whatever is coming out as innovations from uh, the cloud providers, from the open source community, um, like do containers inside, update to pod identity, and so on and so on. Okay, so, you know, in the beginning, when I started and I said, how come we have been automating for as long as I can remember, and this still takes months? Like, have we been doing such a terrible job all along? It's like, thinking about it, it just made me not feel good. But then I thought about it more. And back in the day, it took us months to put a Linux server into production. We had to order it and rack it and install it, and it was months. And then we got EC2 and we could get Linux instances in minutes. And then we had a monolith, and those deployment cycles took six months. Oh, six months, sorry, six weeks. <laughs> six weeks deployment cycles. And then we broke up the monolith tools like Docker and Kubernetes came along and we broke up the monolith. So now we can deploy code instantly. I mean, in a matter of minutes. And then AWS innovated and now it gave us managed databases and event-driven architectures and other resources and those take time to deploy. And now we have new tools to create the APIs to deploy those. And if history as the best predictor of future, I guarantee you, we're gonna create APIs. We're gonna create AWS resources in a matter of minutes. And then, a couple of years from now, the open source community and the cloud providers will innovate more and we'll be sitting here and trying to fix the next bottleneck. And with that, I want you to think about your platforms, not about building them once, and done or rebuilding them from scratch. Building platforms is not about the building, it's about continuously evolving your platform. Thank you so much. Uh, do we have time for questions? I think I'm at time. Uh, we have time for one question, perfect. It's coming, it's right there. Okay. How do you, you, as you said at the end, we our platform has been evolving. How do you, and, and we've had to, at times, recreate the clusters. First we used pre-IKS, then EKS, then we moved to EKS clusters, and whatever will be next. If we take this, a structure, things that need to persist and stay there, like databases and especially their data, how, how would we address it use, if we're using these tools? Because as soon as we, we take out a namespace or take out a, a cluster to create a new one, it all disappears. Okay, so the question is how using these tools now we can, um, for one reason or the other, uh, change our cluster because now those are resources and the state and everything is managed in our cluster. How can I move a database to be managed from one Kubernetes cluster to the other Kubernetes cluster? And um, there are a couple of tools, I think um, the previous talk mentioned one. It's uh, one tool is Valero, uh, but you should, Yes, you should automate for that. You should account for that, uh, certainly. So Valero can back up your etcd and it can recreate it in another cluster. And then you can hand off the, the database from one cluster to the other cluster, the management of databases. Um, today, I see more and more. So before we had to swap from self-managed Kubernetes to EKS, then um, some Organizations still do blue-green updates for Kubernetes. Um, I actually, 
again, I wanted to point, make sure you take what's coming from the cloud providers and the open source community. Uh, today we have Carpenter. If you're still using Cluster Autoscaler, make sure to upgrade to Carpenter. Make sure if you're on Carpenter Alpha, upgrade to Beta. It makes your upgrades much easier, and I foresee they will get even easier to the point there will be hopefully a click of a button one day, to the point where you don't even need to switch Kubernetes clusters anymore. But as of today, use Valero, and we guide organizations through different techniques to switch those managed resources from one cluster to the other. <laughs>